Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We'll give a few more minutes for people to log in and get situated, and we'll begin the webinar. All right, I think this is good. This is a good starting point. We'll go ahead and start today's webinar. <clears throat> Just to let you know that the webinar today is being recorded. And we ask that you excuse any background noises as we're still working from home. After the presentation, we will allow a few minutes for um, some Q&A. So please remember to place your questions in the chat. And without further ado, we're gonna to open today's webinar. We'll have uh, the president and CEO, Stephen Glade, do the um, introduction. Steve? Yep, um, good morning, everybody, and welcome to um, this event that is part of CNHED Small Business Month, um, hosted by our DC Community Anchor Partnership. All month, we have been celebrating and uplifting the importance of small businesses in DC. And I'm really delighted that our Community Anchor Partnership can be one of the activities that we highlight. Just very quickly, the Community Anchor Partnership is a collaborative that we started about six years ago to work with our area health systems, universities, and now utility companies to provide more procurement opportunities to uh, minority businesses in DC. And one of the ways that it works is that we work collaboratively inside the institutions to help them develop better outreach communications and systems to reach minority businesses. I am delighted that we are celebrating um, and acknowledging Georgetown University today. Um, Georgetown was the first anchor uh, to say yes uh, to participating in this. And the person I'm getting ready to introduce uh, is the person that said yes on behalf of Georgetown. And I have to share a little bit of history. Um, Chris Murphy, who I'm gonna formally introduce, uh, I've worked with before and my uh, his history with Chris uh, always reminds me that he is a very definitive decision maker. Uh, he can look at an issue and instantly see its value or its lack of value. Um, when I talked to Chris about uh, joining, having Georgetown University um, join DCAP, he instantly said yes. And Chris doesn't know this to this day, but I was braced for that answer because in our former lives, Chris and I worked for the mayor of DC. I was the mayor's director of community affairs and Chris was the mayor's chief of staff. And I remember this is an answer, this is, a, this is a, an example of a not so good idea landing at Chris's feet. One morning I came running into Chris's office and I said, Chris, I have a great idea. And he said, sure, what is it? And I said, once a month, it would be good if the mayor could sit in my office and answer the phone calls coming in from residents. And Chris looked at me and said, I'm not so sure about that idea. And I remember saying, but why, it would be great. You know, it would be a great way to connect. And then after, two weeks of me answering my own phone, I realized that it was not such a good idea. And Chris actually may have saved me from an early exit from the mayor's office had he actually said yes. So when we approached Chris about having Georgetown come on board, um, he instantly saw the value in it. He said, yes, this is something good and we probably need some help and we'd love to partner. And Georgetown's yes actually leveraged what now are 10 other anchors in DC participating in the DCAP initiative. So uh, I, I, I don't know, Chris, that you ever had the full backdrop of appreciation <laughs> for the yes that you gave us on Georgetown, or if you remember the no that saved my career <laughs> in the mayor's office. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce Chris Murphy. He joined Georgetown University in 2015 after 25 years in the nonprofit and local and federal government sectors. As the university's first vice president for government relations and community engagement, Chris coordinates the university's strategic engagement with federal, 
and District of Columbia governments, community organizations and leaders, and the Georgetown neighborhood. Through this work, he seeks to advance the university's long-term sustainability, enrich students' academic experience, and promote the common good for the university. Prior to coming to Georgetown, Chris served in a variety of leadership roles, including Chief of Staff to, the Washington, to Washington, D.C. Mayor Vincent Gray, Deputy Chief of Staff to the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development Secretary Sean Donovan, and General Counsel of Atlanta Media Company. Chris, welcome and thank you. Steve, thank you. And I have a very different memory of our time together because my memory is that whatever you asked, I said yes to. <laughs> But, but thank you for that very funny and, and overly generous introduction. Um, I'm just going to say a few words and then kick it over to my colleagues that are doing the, the actual great work uh, on this program. Um, but I thought, first, let me just say a huge thank you to, to CNHED and in particular to Steve and, and, and Lindsay um, for your leadership of the work on DCAP. We are, are huge admirers of your work. Um, uh, and, and I really appreciate the opportunity to present today, but as much as I appreciate that, I, I appreciate even more um, the work that, that we've done together over the last five, six, seven years. Um, and I, I think that you guys are everything we ever could have asked for or hoped for in a partner in that you've been patient when we needed you to be patient, but we've, you've also been a little pushy when we've needed you to be pushy. So um, I really mean that we could not have asked for a better partner. Um, and you know, I'm huge fans of, of Dolores and Tanya that, that you've, you've brought as a resource to us as well. So, you know, I, I'm reminded of that, that proverb, of, you know, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go go together. And um, I think we've come this far um, because we've we've gone together. So thank you for your leadership, um, you know, in DC, but also just what it's meant to Georgetown and in terms of helping us make the progress that we've made. So I'm, I'm grateful. Thank um, you, Chris. Um, yeah, I, I, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. You were gonna no, say you go ahead. No, go ahead. I was going to say that um, I, I kind of saved this for the end. Georgetown was not only the first to say yes to the initiative, they were the first to dedicate a team inside the university, inside the institution to work with it. And Georgetown has a great team that you're getting ready to meet um, that works on this. I think dedic the dedication of that team is really important. When this work shows up inside an institution, generally there's not a team oriented or focused on it or engineered to support. Georgetown quickly realized that and put the team together in place that you're getting ready to meet, uh, Maya, Orlando, and Dejanil. And they have been really working amazingly with Lindsay, with our consultants, and with our businesses. The other thing that Georgetown was the first to do was to actually have the president of the university sign a formal policy with a program with goals. And anybody who knows this work and does this work knows having those frame that, that infrastructure surrounding the work is vitally important. And I think that's one of the things that Chris meant when he mentioned patience, because it took a while to put together something that the university could commit to, um, knowing that it would not only take it seriously, but ultimately even be held accountable. Uh, for yeah, what those yeah. frameworks are. So I yeah. wanted to lift up some other first um, uh, poster remarks, Chris. Yeah, no, I think that's right. And, and that's sort of consistent with where I was going, which is that, you know, uh, we started this work in, in 2015 and um, it's, it's, we just announced earlier this year our, our measurable goals very publicly. And um, on the one hand, you could look at that and say, what the heck took you so long? Um, but I think what we learned is we did not want to announce something. I, I don't want to disparage others' commitments, but we know it's very fashionable right now to make these kind of commitments. And, and in a year, I'm somewhat skeptical that some of those other commitments are going to, going to lead to real change. We at Georgetown did not want to make commitments until we were confident that we could deliver on them. And so that took us more time than I wish. But the most important thing is that we got here. So we started this work for a number of reasons in 2015. Um, Steve will remember in, in 2016, the Urban Institute issued um, a report about anchor institutions and the role they play in their community that, that had quite a bit of an impact on us internally. Um, we're also always motivated at Georgetown by our, the Jesuit imperative um, to, to focus on, on improving the common good. 
that you heard that a lot at Georgetown um, about what, what can we do to contribute to the common good. Um, but I think, frankly, it also connects um, in, a, in a soulful way to Georgetown's work to grapple with our connection and legacy of slavery. And um, it is a source of shame um, for us as an institution and uh, as it should. And we continue to wrestle with that legacy and, and what does that mean? for us. Um, there has been a lot of work. Our president made a lot of commitments on the academic side of the house. We established a racial justice institute. We've made some very high profile academic hires to do research in this area. Um, we established a, a slavery memory and reconciliation task force um, to come up with some recommendations. But I think um, we were challenged, those of us on the administrative side of the house, of but what can you do to contribute um, to our effort to, to grapple with, with this tragic legacy? And so I think we've, we view our work in this area um, as coming from a number of angles, um, but I think that, 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 that what can we do to contribute to uh, racial and social justice um, connected to that legacy, I think is, 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 is a big motivator for us. Um, and, and so I'm, I'm proud that you know, we, were, we were looking at these issues and working on these issues uh, long before the tragedy and, of, and the murder of George Floyd. Um, uh, and others are newer to, the, to that cause and we welcome them. Um, but I think from our perspective, you know, and what I always say to folks is don't do this because it'll get you a headline. Do this because you know it's the right thing to do and, and you have a plan to really do it. Um, so as, as you're going to hear from my terrific colleagues that are working on this, we really spent a lot of time, uh, you know, and, and working with Steve and working with the consultants to make sure that we had the systems and processes in place to make this real so that it gave us the comfort that we needed to make this very public announcement about what our targets are. And you know, Orlando and, and Maya and, and Dejanil are, are working hard to make sure that we uh, live up to those commitments. So um, I think probably the time is better off with me turning it over to them to walk you through what we're actually doing. But I will just conclude with, with again, a huge thank you to CNHED and my colleagues, and frankly, everyone on this Zoom um, who is interested in potentially partnering with us um, to on this journey that we're on together. So i um, grateful for the opportunity and, and excited to give my colleagues a chance to share what they're doing. Thank you, Chris. I just wanna illuminate one thing that you said that I think is absolutely right. Um, everyone's awareness has grown around the need for systems change and disparity that our society is experiencing. And if we're not careful, we wanna rush to finish lines to say we've done something. Systems change, it takes time. <clears throat> Funders, politicians, media, and more want to say that they are helping and supporting addressing the issue, and they want it done in 18 months, and it just does not happen that way. So this has been a, a mutual learning experience and journey with each other, with you and your team uh, at Georgetown. I am very proud of the work your team has done to really re-engineer um, how they see their work. Um, how they allow us to engage, how we reach out to the MBE community. I think it's gonna serve us for decades to come. So I just wanna publicly thank you and the team for the nature of the work that we've done and how we've gone about it. And I'll turn it over to Lindsay so uh, she can get us started. Thank you, thank you, Steve. And hello everyone, uh, my name is Lindsay Poole and I serve as Vice President of Strategic Partnerships here at CNHED and have the joy of overseeing our DCAP initiative. And I too just wanna to echo um, my thanks to you, Chris, um, for your leadership. You know, conversations with all of the different institutions that are a part of DCAP and with anchor collaboratives across the country, one thing that always comes up is how critical it is for leadership to not only champion this work, but to really establish it as a business priority and to build the infrastructure to make that priority possible to the point that you made earlier. So I, I really wanna thank you for your advocacy and for that of um, the broader Georgetown University leadership. Um, and I wanna welcome all of the businesses who are here. I, I hope that you find it helpful and insightful to hear the perspective of an institution 
that has really been working at making a supplier diversity program uh, possible. So with that, I have the opportunity of introducing this fabulous team that both Steve and Chris have mentioned, um, the Georgetown University Procurement and Strategic Sourcing Team, who really leads the day-to-day -day operations when it comes to implementing um, Georgetown's newly launched Supplier Diversity Program. And it has really been just incredible and a joy to watch you all and to work alongside you over the last few years in developing this program and just really have an appreciation for the kind of time and effort that went into making it all possible. So with that, we have with us today, Orlando Jones, who is Director of Strategic Sourcing and Maya Brown, who is Supplier Diversity Manager and Dejanil Brown, who is strategic sourcing analyst. And we'll get to hear from the team today more about Georgetown's um, procurement process, the supplier diversity program, um, you know, what are some best practices around their RFPs, um, as, as well as um, what some of the upcoming opportunities are. And before I hand things over to you, Orlando, I do want to give a shout out. I see we have another member of your team, Robert Hunter, who is here. Um, watching today. Thank you for joining us, Robert. Um, and for anyone who has any questions, please do drop them in the chat. I'll be monitoring them and passing your questions over to the team. And we'll also reserve some time at the end to address any questions that might have gone unanswered. So with that, Orlando, over to you. Thank you, Lindsay. And good morning, everyone. Glad you guys can join. So in 2016, I want to share my screen. In 2016, when Georgetown joined DCAP, we were already committed to supply and diversity, but a lot of our efforts were project-based, one-off-based, different initiatives. And we wanted to see how can we take that to another level and have something not just more inclusive but more impactful in the in our community. So we started our supplier diversity program. Our supplier diversity program, the vision was to foster a purchasing climate that encourages diverse business to compete for university business. We strive to reduce barriers, participation in university purchasing activities, are committed to building relationships with diverse group of vendors. So most of you guys by now are like, what do all these words mean? Why is that important? To achieve this, what we wanted to do is we developed a three-pronged approach. For this approach, we wanted to give supply support, like right? providing diverse suppliers with the tools and opportunity to do business at Georgetown. Some of these tools are helpful two kits for RFP. Um, when, if you submit an RFP, you get instant basically contact with either myself or any sourcing manager at Georgetown to help you for the next RFP. You get access in the program to solicitations that we'll be putting out, have already put out or upcoming. Um, you get information and which is the most important part. You get information all across the board about what our procurement process is, opportunity that's coming up, how we can even sometimes partner you with other larger corporations to give you subcontractor or tier two opportunities and anything in that realm. That's what the program gives you access to. Another portion of the program, we're like, well, and we're creating these opportunities for suppliers and we're getting suppliers in here and we're getting you guys information. Well, how do we capitalize on that? What do we have to do internally to capitalize on that? Which is the second prong is our community education. This is where myself, my team, and other members of procurement services, we basically go around to every school and department in the university and give them guidance on supply and diversity, teach them about supply and diversity, give them access to all of our diverse suppliers in our preferred supplier list, 
and then give them hands on help with different solicitation that they may want, but we can identify opportunities for diverse suppliers, whether it's something as uh, simple or straight um, forward as graphic design, or whether it's something larger where we partner you um, with a company with in telecommunications. It's but we have that direct connection now that we're meeting with all of these schools and departments on a continuous basis. Then you heard Steve and Chris mention leadership support, which is the third prong of how we approach the entire program. We've got our leadership to commit to by 2025, 20% of our entire spend will be going towards diverse suppliers. That's what's been committed by the president on down. And when you at a university that can spend over half a billion dollars a year, you can see how 20% of that can immensely affect the community. Another goal we committed to is 10% of our overall supplier base to be diverse suppliers. We currently have a supplier base of almost 10,000 suppliers. So we want another 10% of that to just be diverse suppliers only. We have a large list of other goals that I won't go through, but you guys will definitely have the opportunity to see if you head to the link provided. This is where you get more information about our supplier diversity program and everything else that we're doing to try to help you guys succeed and do business here at the university. Back to you, Liz. Thank you, Orlando. And I'll actually hand back over to Maya. Thank you, Lindsay, and good morning, everyone. Um, Lindsay, I just wanted to uh, say thank you for um, all you have done to support Georgetown, um, this program, and for myself personally. Um, I truly wish you nothing but the best in your future endeavors. Um, I also appreciate the opportunity for Georgetown to speak on our new supplier diversity program. I feel it is important to have this space to outreach and inform the community on what we are working on behind the scenes to support and promote diverse businesses at our institution. In order to do business with Georgetown University, there are expectations, requirements, and qualifications, all of which uh, we will be going over this morning. In order to do business with Georgetown University, um, <clears throat> we are looking to partner with like, diverse suppliers to enhance our business uh, diversity and equity. There are a handful of uh, standard requirements for conducting business with Georgetown University. Uh, one, you must have a business email address, um, phone number, and company uh, website, accept and agree to Georgetown standard terms and conditions. You will need to be able to process online orders and transaction-specific invoice submissions in a timely manner. We will need for you to understand formal competitive bidding processes and protocols, maintain business insurance that meets or exceeds Georgetown's requirement, and lastly, we require our suppliers to accept credit card and ACH payments. Qualified businesses must uh, share our commitment to deliver the highest level of client service and support, user-friendly and efficient processes, and timely delivery of quality products and services. Georgetown University Strategic Sourcing expects suppliers to provide the appropriate scale and capacity, establishing a customer-focused enterprise, going beyond the required scope, deliver excellent products and services, maintain the highest standard of performance and responsiveness. These lists and the um, diverse supplier interest form can be found on our Doing Business with Georgetown University site. Um, and that link is actually in the chat. Um, once you get to um, that site, the Doing Business with Georgetown University site, you will see um, the diversity, um, the diverse supplier interest form where you'll be asked to provide uh, general information. Just please be sure you are providing the most accurate and up-to-date contact and business information. 
<clears throat> about halfway down the form, um, you will begin to see the diversity questions. You want to make sure that you provide the requested information for each um, qualification that you are uh, have a certification in. Um, towards the end of the form, you will be asked to describe your company's products um, and, or services that you offer. You want to take advantage of this opportunity and be as descriptive as possible. And finally, the last section um, of the interest form will require you to submit five professional references. This is a requirement, so make sure that you do fill in five of them. Keep in mind, in order to consider to be considered for the uh, Supply Diversity Program, um, you will need to fall within the following classifications. Uh, Women-owned business, veteran-owned, service-disabled, veteran-owned, disability-owned, disadvantaged business, minority own and LGBTQ. Um, again, this list can end a lot of other references and resources that we have can be found on the Supplier Diversity site. And that link um, is also in the chat. Um, if uh, you do not fall within that list, that um, this list, you will, uh, there's another form that you can fill out, the general supplier interest form. Um, same questions, just you don't have to provide the um, certifications. So once our team receives your interest form uh, results, your information will be reviewed to determine if your organization fits current sourcing initiatives, and you will be added to a list of recipients for upcoming sourcing efforts. If you have already submitted this interest form and your company has new capabilities or product offerings, please update your information by resubmitting the interest form. Uh, if GU decides to consider your company for a product or service, the university will release a formal competitive bid using um, requests for information, requests for quotation, um, and requests for proposals, all of which Deja Neal, um, our strategic sourcing analyst, will cover. Thanks. Thank you, Maya. I'll go ahead and share my screen now. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, just to echo the sentiment of everyone else on the call, we're very excited at Georgetown to um, start to implement a successful supplier diversity program. So I'll go ahead and just talk a little bit about the request for proposal process. It's very similar for RFIs and RFQs as well. These are our mission, vision, and values as a department at Georgetown, and we'd like them to be in alignment with the overall Jesuit values of the university. So we wanna provide strategic sourcing guidance, efficient and cost-effective contract and procurement activities, timely payment process, and superior customer service in support of the overall mission of the university. Our vision as a department aims to serve the GU community by establishing university-wide agreements for requesting external vendors to deliver goods and services in order to best serve our community and meet the needs of each individual stakeholder department and campus. We're consistently working to improve our supplier relations and establish agreements with frequently requested suppliers. We focus on ethical practice, stakeholder and supplier experience, cost savings, consistency and communication and performance and process improvement. The request for proposal process at the university um, is kind of categorized into four steps. So in the beginning, we work with our stakeholders to develop the scope of work, and then we publish the RFP. On average, suppliers are given three business days to respond with their intent to bid to the RFP, and two additional weeks to provide their RFP response, depending on the scale of the RFP. So we'll disseminate the RFP, receive intents to bid, and then offer an opportunity for suppliers to give us questions regarding the RFP documents. And um, we work with our committees um, and stakeholders to respond to those questions. We then go through the supplier evaluation and vetting process, which takes around one to two weeks to complete, depending on the size of the RFP. And we go through a stakeholder scoring process where um, the RFP committee reviews all of the documents that were submitted for the RFP and uses a scorecard that's standardized to develop um, who is going to rank um, between the natural breaks. So sometimes if, if there's 30 suppliers, um, the top may be 15. If there's five suppliers, the top may be two or three. We then develop our strategic sourcing recommendation and present a business case to the stakeholders and leadership and move forward to contract award. 
So the stakeholder engagement process um, begins with developing out the scope. We wanna make sure that the core competencies of the scope are well understood by all parties. And as we craft the scope, we collaborate with the sourcing manager and the stakeholder to define the project feature requirements, what the non-negotiable um, terms are, what the flexible terms are, and then we identify qualified suppliers to invite to bid. As members of the supplier diversity program at Georgetown University, you're given an exclusive opportunity to bid. And we craft the RFP. Once we get to the publishing state, <clears throat> step the sourcing manager will confirm the list of suppliers with the stakeholders and the strategic sourcing database with our diverse suppliers and make sure everybody is in alignment with the university supplier diversity program we allow the suppliers to give us three uh, give us an intent to bid over a few business days and respond to the rfp we give them two to four additional weeks to submit questions and develop their full rfp package response the supplier Q&A, again, is a collaborative effort between the sourcing manager and the stakeholders, and that's really the time where the suppliers are able to ask us questions before submitting their finalized RFP packages. Once we receive all of the RFP packages, the stakeholders go through the scoring process. Um, the sourcing manager and the stakeholder collaboratively determine what the scoring criteria is going to be, and that's clearly outlined in the RFP documents. The scoring analysis is done by um, myself, and we, like I said, take the natural break of top scores to decide if we're going to offer um, Zoom presentations or in-person presentations. And then we go from the scorecard results to the scoring committee and collaboratively determine whether or not there need to be presentations. We develop our best recommendation um, and we format a business case for leadership to determine who they would like to go with. So a little bit about what Maya does in the RFP process is the supplier vetting. So she makes sure that the businesses um, meet the qualifications that Georgetown University has. She performs research on the company's capability, bandwidth, their web address, all of the documents and key personnel that they propose for the RFP. From that point, the sourcing manager will notify the awardee and we'll go into the contract negotiation phase. I do believe that we've provided um, Lindsay and team with some winning RFP examples. So if you have any questions about what makes a good robust RFP response, um, how is Georgetown looking to evaluate their suppliers and things of that nature, we can provide you with an example of an RFP response that was awarded. And at this point, I'll just um, leave an opportunity for people to ask questions and punt it back to Lindsay. Thank you so much, Maya and Dejanil. So we do have one question that we've got in. Um, it says, I believe in strategic sourcing, efficiencies and realizing economies of scale and understand organizations, um, including Georgetown want to accomplish that. How are you at Georgetown balancing that with also ensuring that the scopes of work included in projects have been broken out into economically feasible units to really facilitate um, diverse business enterprise or minority business enterprise participation? I'll go ahead and answer this one. Um, so as a part of our supplier diversity program, as Orlando mentioned earlier, we're using a top-down leadership approach to determine what percentages of our overall spend as a university and what percentages of our supplier utilization are diverse suppliers. So the university has an overall effort that's been agreed upon um, from the president level to the CFO leadership on down to reach that 20% mark. Um, and that is really what we're utilizing when we determine commodities that would be specifically um, more beneficial for diverse suppliers to bid on those RFPs. I think just by nature, there are certain um, categories or industries of, that um, there are more diverse suppliers in. So we do have targeted commodities. For instance, um, I wanna say we're looking at any contract that's getting ready to expire that we're going to take to the market and we identify if there's opportunity for diverse suppliers first by sending that information over to um, CNHED and to determine um, on our database of diverse suppliers who there is in the, from the beginning before we even release the RFP to the market. 
I think that that does help give everybody a fair chance um, and then allows us to incorporate some extra points maybe in the scoring process for diverse suppliers as well. I hope that answers your question. Thank you, Dejanil. Oh, Orlando, go ahead. Apologies coming off of me. <laughs> I didn't have anything else to add to that. Okay. And I do want to emphasize um, because Dejanil uh, mentioned the engagement with CNHED and the RFP process, I know a lot of the businesses who are here um, may be familiar with our process because we've reached out to you. But for those businesses who might be new to learning about DCAP, um, I do want to share. So when we learn of an RFP through our partnership with Georgetown, one of the things that we'll do is look through our database to identify which businesses within our network might be a good match for this RFP. We'll reach out to you, you know, share with you what the opportunity is, have a conversation about your um, capability and capacity, and if this is an opportunity of interest. And then we do provide that referral over to the university for them to consider. And one of the services that we offer specifically as it relates to bidding responses is to review and provide any feedback on the RFP. So if that is something that is of interest to you, um, Dejanil mentioned, we've had conversations about, you know, what it is that Georgetown looks at um, for successful RFPs. So I just want to make sure I point out that that is a, a service available to the businesses who we're, we're reaching out to as it relates to opportunities with the university. So thank you for that. Another question is what can businesses do now to best prepare for um, competitiveness for future solicitations? Um, that's a great question. One of the things you can do, we have a very close working relationship in the DC, the DC Anchor Partnership with CNHED. Um, if you're unsure about any proposal or the direction you should go in or responding to that proposal, I would encourage you to reach out to CNHED as obviously as a team administering the RFP, we can't give you an unfair or competitive advantage. But due to our relationship with CNADD, they have access to information that could greatly help you and prepare you for an RFP. Also, if you have any questions considering uh, regarding uh, solicitation, um, questions that we are able to answer, you can always email us at sourcing at georgetown.edu. I'll put that in the chat as well. Um, feel free to reach out to us. We try to make ourselves accessible as we can. And we will always help you and direct you and give you the information or guidance that doesn't give you an advantage to an RP. I think that's the best political way I can put it. Thank you, Orlando. A previous slide stated that Georgetown is looking for contractors to go beyond the stated scope. Can you clarify that? I think the, the major concern- repeat the, repeat the question. You broke up a little it, bit for me. Yep, so it says a previous slide stated that Georgetown is looking for contractors to go beyond the stated scope. Can you clarify that? beyond the status quo. Um, I think the best way to clarify that would just be we're looking for partners. We're looking for not just someone to come in and be able to perform the services, but someone that wants to be a long-term partner and have a relationship with Georgetown. Um, without taking over sourcing, we had a more concerted effort to not have relationships where we just, you're a contractor, we're a university, and we're cutting you a check. We want um, suppliers that can actually come to the university and either help you grow, because if we help you grow, you can help other businesses 
start the DC Metro area to grow as well. And we want to form partnerships where we can create opportunities that allow your company, when you do grow, to be able to maybe provide scholarships for Georgetown students or internships for Georgetown students. Anything that can be beneficial outside of just doing the actual work. And hearing you say that, Orlando, um, I'll, I'll do a quick plug. So one of the things that DCAP has done is host RFP response strategy trainings. And we hosted one, maybe it was a month ago or so. Um, and one of the points of conversation that we had was around really understanding the client and taking the time to do that additional research to get a sense of what their values are, what their business priorities are, and speaking to that as a competitive advantage in your solicitation response. Um, and we're also, another quick plug, doing another RFP training um, next week as part of this a mini series that we're doing around institutional procurement for Small Business Month. So um, at the end of this call, we'll make sure to share the information um, but the training next week will specifically focus on pricing, if that's of interest to any of the businesses who are on today. So Deja Neal, you mentioned the copy of the successful RFP, and we have some businesses interested in knowing how they can get their hands on that. Yes, so um, I think we have a scrubbed RFP that doesn't have the supplier's name on it with all of the information. So after this call, if anyone is interested in seeing what a, a winning awarded RFP looks like, um, we can try and find something that's in your area of industry. And if not, we can definitely just provide a general one. Um, Lindsay, I'm, I think in the past we had discussed this. Um, and so if that's something that we need to send over again, definitely can. Okay. Yep. I think that sounds great. And in the meantime, would it be appropriate for folks to reach out to sourcing at georgetown.edu? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. We have another question here. Um, if I heard correctly, after submission, a business case is made to Georgetown leadership for making an award occurs toward the end of the process, how likely is it that an opportunity gets canceled at that point? And, and the at business owner point. makes the point that they're, they're asking this because of, of course, the amount of time investment, resource investment that it takes in right. developing those proposals. Oh, at, at, at that point, not likely at all. Maybe uh, if, if I had to put a number on it, maybe 2% chance. At, at that point, not only has the supplier invested their time and resources to respond to RFP, but internally we've invested our time and resources to perform the RFP and prevent, present the business case. And the business case is not to, in, in our instance, the business case is never to convince um, the stakeholder or leadership to get those services is usually to recommend who we think they should go with for those services. And any um, perspective you can offer on red flags, you know, th things that you might see when you get a solicitation that might immediately disqualify a business or cause you to say, we're not going to move this, this business forward? Um, immediate things right off that you notice. So, with, uh, you see this a lot. So, usually in our R RPs, we have um, detailed sections and it's sometimes a company with been their response spreadsheets that ask very specific questions. Um, what a lot of companies do, instead of responding with not applicable, applicable, with not applicable, they will respond and just not answer the question. 
if the question does not apply to you or your business, always better the NA than to give a response that has nothing to do with what we're asking. Okay, that's a good and one. Another one would be, um, like, sometimes you have to remember that everything is, some things are a stepping stone and some things are a progress. If you don't have a past performance of doing $100 million projects, it's okay. Just go for $5 million projects or $10 million projects or even $1 million projects. We do look for a lot of times for consistency for larger projects that are probably not your run of the mill RP solicitations. So keep that in mind when you we understand everybody wants to progress and take that leap and advance their business. But from the university standpoint, it has to make sense for us as well. So sometimes your past performance and at the projects that you've done previous, it it matters. Okay. Can you speak to your flexibility in insurance requirements? Many of the larger companies require high insurance rate requirements. That's a that's a big one. Comes up quite a bit. That is, we, and, and yes, we get that a lot. There is flexibility in some of our insurance cases, depending on the commodity and the type of service. Um, an example would be, we're not, don't necessarily ask a graphic designer to carry the same same amount of insurance as a general contractor, right? Now, even though our standard terms and conditions have the same standard insurance qualifications all throughout, in examples like that, it can be adjusted. It's just not real. It would. It's not. It, it will be an unrealistic expectation for us to expect. Expect. Uh, small, diverse supplier or small, diverse graphic designer to carry, to carry the same insurance or a $50 million a year general contractor. So we do pay, we do pay attention to those things, even though they're standard language in our contracts and in our RP, we absolutely evaluate and pay attention to the commodity that we're trying to solicit. And Orlando, is there ever opportunity to negotiate insurance requirements as things are moving forward? Yes, in those in that exact example I gave you, like so for different commodities, there are opportunities to negotiate insurance because in that service you may not be required, and it's not really requirement because you don't have as many liabilities and risks um, in that service, like in. I harp on graphic design because it's it's an easy one to really point kind of pinpoint. Like a graph, most graphic designers don't have the need to carry a million dollars worth of insurance or two million aggregate. Even though that's standard contract language for us, we we totally understand that that just wouldn't be realistic, especially for a smaller graphic designer, which we use all the time. Right? Okay. Okay. Are collaborations with larger companies allowed in order to win an RFP since that may be the only way to gain entrance? Absolutely. And sometimes we encourage it. Sometimes I even connect smaller businesses with larger ones. I've done this for um, suppliers that uh, DGAP or CNHD has brought to me in the past. Um, when they maybe didn't qualify for a certain solicitation on their own, we partnered them up with someone else. And not only did they, not only did that then qualify them, but it actually created an existing, uh, well, a new business relationship that they still use currently. Um, I'm just avoiding giving out names because maybe they don't want their business affairs 
put out there. But yes, we help facilitate partnerships and you are more we more than encourage you to create partnerships on your own if it helps you qualify to solicit for an RP. Thank you. Well, it looks like our questions are slowing down. So I think as we're coming to a close here, I just want to offer Orlando, Maya, and Dejanil, each of you, an opportunity to share any final words of wisdom or advice for businesses as they're looking to pursue opportunities with Georgetown. So um, Orlando, why don't we start with you since you're already off mute? Um, I would just like to say I've been around um, since 2016 when we originally joined DCAP. I've been around to different networking events, different social events that uh, CNACD has had, other minority business councils. And I, I understand I get the same message that we used to get a lot that small businesses and diverse suppliers didn't feel that Georgetown was taking supply diversity serious or that there were actual true opportunities for you guys. There is a new regime that has changed and we encourage everyone to uh, seek opportunities at Georgetown. We are working diligently to create uh, a more inclusive and opportunity environment for everyone. So don't get discouraged, things take time, but definitely respond to any solicitation that you uh, feel like you're qualified for. And please reach out to CNABD for their help if you need it. And feel free to use sourcing at georgetown.edu for any questions that you may have. I would like to piggyback on what Orlando said. Um, we do have a host of resources on our website. Um, I do encourage the suppliers to go on there and to click around and to read and to study and to use those links that are on there. Um, and then definitely reach out to CNHED. Um, they, they do have a, a lot of resources, a lot of um, information that you can benefit from. Um, and if you do not get bids that you have, or, um, Bids, if your bid has not gone through, I would recommend to continue to um, to continue to bid, continue to put your proposals in. Don't stop. Don't think that just because you don't get it one time, that's it. I would encourage you to continue to network and continue to find other companies that you can kind of partner with um, to you know get your foot in the door. Uh, but definitely use the resources that we have out there for you. Um, they're there for a reason, and, and we really. Uh, do want to help where we can, and we are listening, and we are working, we are studying, we are trying. So continue to use the resources that we have out there to put yourself in a um, in a really good position. And I got one more tidbit. Um, so you guys know, and this is how most universities, our fiscal year is from July 1st to June 30th, right? It's not the normal January 1st to December 31st. So with that being said, Georgetown does a host of projects in the summer. So always going into April, May, you, you, you're gonna have an increased amount of solicitations that you'll be able to bid for. Keep that in mind. That's it. A, a lot of people don't realize that. And especially towards May and June, because it's like most large corporations, you gotta spend money on your budget, because if you don't, Guess what? Your budget is going to be smaller than the following year. And during the kind of fall months, when school has started, things slow down for us. Then they pick back up in March. And so with that being said, come this July 1st, you'll be able to find most of our open solicitations on our website. That'll be coming. It'll be interactive. It'll be fluid. And so it'll kind of give you guys uh, a view into the cadence and how university uh, solicitations work. So during those spring months, you'll see it flooded. And then kind of during those winter months, you'll see it slow down. So just a little tidbit to keep in mind. 
Now, Orlando, I just want to make sure I heard you correctly. Did you say July 1, Georgetown is going to post publicly the solicitations on your site? Yes. All right. On July 1. Okay. Start of the new fiscal year. Great, great. And Dejanil, over to you. I don't have a whole lot to add. My team members do a great job of um, highlighting all of the things about the program. Just want to let everyone know, um, I do look at the sourcing email every day. And um, if there's any questions that you have regarding any upcoming solicitations um, or just any questions, if you're you know, in the process of crafting an RFP proposal and um, anything that I can give you information on, we definitely will. Thank you to you all. And before we officially close out, I do wanna hand back over to Steve to say some words. I just wanna say thank you to the Georgetown team, but I really wanna say it reflectively. When we launched DCAP about five and a half, six years ago, one of our original investors, as he was making remarks, he said two things that I, do, I know I didn't fully appreciate. What he said at that event was, Moving this forward is going to be about two things, developing new relationships and cultivating champions. And I didn't really understand it at the time. You know, those are cute phrases, they sound good, but nothing could have rung to be more true. So at that time I envisioned it meant relationships between the business community and these institutions, and it does. But what really has platformed is a relationship between CNHED and DCAP in these institutions. And if you really heard what's being said here today, you're seeing a reflection of that relationship that everyone has worked so hard to build. The other thing that you're seeing is three, and there are more at Georgetown, but three great champions in front of you. Um, Maya, Orlando, and DeGeneo's desire to connect and to help the MBE community in DC is authentic. We are all constantly searching for ways to engineer that and to support that, but it really starts with authenticity and we have that in these three champions. So I wanna thank you. Lastly, and I didn't do this at the beginning because I'm just still in such denial. I wanna publicly say thank you to Lindsay for her tenure of service to DCAP. Uh, Lindsay is moving on to, uh, I'm going to never believe it's a better job, but she's moving on to a different job. Uh, and I just wanna publicly thank you, Lindsay, for your amazing stewardship and leadership of DCAP um, since you joined. Uh, in the beginning, I thought the person who needed to lead this work needed to be you know, a deep subject matter expert, needed to know procurement minority supplier work, um, and Lindsay does now. Um, and so she, um, she, has, she has cultivated an amazing knowledge base. But what I realized more was that it was a certain type of person, a certain type of leader that needed to hold us all together. And Lindsay has exemplified that. Her respect inside all the institutions, within the MBE community, within the investor community is something that's gonna be very, very difficult um, to replace. In fact, she can't be replaced. She can be succeeded. She will have to be. But Lindsay, I just want to publicly thank you um, for your time of service and for your amazing leadership and effectiveness in the position. And best of luck. I've told Lindsay that I want her to do things differently than many people her age do, because generally people her age, when they move on, they really move on. I told her I want her to stay connected. And since she's going into a position that's over giving out money, she better sprinkle some money decaps way. So I want everybody to be on the look for that. So Lindsay, thank you so much for your amazing service. And Georgetown team, thank you so much for your amazing leadership and the relationship you've built with us in the MBE community. Thank you much, so much for that, Steve. I was not expecting you to say those words. And I have to say some of the greatest joys that I've had through my experience with DCAP have been working with this team and of course with you Steve and for all the businesses who are on it's been a joy working with you and this is such a perfect way to to celebrate all that's all that we've put in over the years and I'm just so grateful to this team I have to say that again I know um, you all have a lot on your plate right now with RFPs currently that you're reviewing 
Maya's getting ready to go to a, a budget owner meeting as part of their internal roadshow. All the businesses on, it takes, um, it's a huge investment of your time to be here with us today. And these relationships are what make this work so rich. And I know that they will continue. So thank you everyone for going. Um, I'm sorry, for coming. And we look forward to hopefully seeing you next week on Wednesday, June 1st for our RFP pricing strategies training. Thank you so much, Raina, for pulling that up and have a great rest of your day. Bye everyone.